good morning. So good to see you on this Lord's Sunday as we have gathered to worship together. Thank you for leading us this morning. John Mark, in case some of you don't know him, is a sophomore at William Carey's, our intern this uh, semester again. And uh, he's leading us today as part of our opportunity to influence and impact the next generation, be a part of learning to lead. And so thank you, John Mark, for leading us. And Justin, as you help in that process together, did a great job this morning. If you have a copy of God's Word, you're in Galatians chapter 1. Uh, if you don't know where that is, go to 2 Corinthians and take a right. You'll get right there. It's a right in between 2 Corinthians and Ephesians. The book of Galatians together, we begin a brand new series, Freedom in Christ Jesus. This is an exciting time. We're going to spend the rest of our fall together diving into this book together to see what God's Word has for us. It's going to connect beautifully to where we've just been in this series of Grace is Greater. For Galatians, really, is all about grace. And so I just want to kind of dive into that over these next several months together and see what God has in store for us. While you're turning there, we have 50 connections to celebrate. And by the way, we're our total now. We're at 1,867 connections. So let's celebrate that together this morning. Exciting to see. Keep making those connections. I'm so excited. That means maybe by the end of the month we'll be at 2,000. That is exciting. I don't know if we'd imagined uh, last fall as we were praying and planning about what would 2023 look like, we would have imagined something this full. So, so excited. I hope you'll continue to make those connections that matter significantly. Well, we want to look at the book of Galatians together and think about this idea this morning about where we are in our freedom in Christ Jesus. And when we begin a brand new book, it's very helpful, maybe as you read God's Word, as you study your Bible on your own, that when you begin a brand new book, it's very helpful to stop and think about a couple of questions that help set the stage for what, when you read Galatians, you have some understanding and some some perspective on what is written, who writes it, who is it written to, when was it written. And what was the purpose over all the book? It keeps us from from proof texting, from grabbing a verse and saying, well, this is this verse and and I want to use it for this reason. No, it has to fit in the whole context of the book of Galatians. So let's just talk about just very quickly about the introduction to the book of Galatians quickly. Number one, we believe the people, we believe that the person that wrote the book was the Apostle Paul. And most scholars would tell you they believe Apostle Paul was the writer. Now, there may be a few other thoughts about that, but by and large, most scholars believe that the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Galatians. Now, the book that itself was written to what people? It's written to the churches in Galatia. Now, this is very, very important. It's written to the churches of Galatia. Now, there was not a, there was not a city called Galatia. There was a region called Galatia. Let me see. Hopefully we have the map here. We can kind of take a look here of where we're talking about this particular area. You can see Galatia really kind of had perhaps, we don't know if it was just a southern part here where these cities in particular are listed and there are others, or there was a northern region here. But this is what we call modern day Turkey right here. And that's where this Galatian region was actually written. And so some of the cities that the Apostle Paul went to on this first, this is marking his first missionary journey to Perga, to Lystra, to Iconium, and to Derbe. And he departed from the city of Antioch. Now, we've got two different Antiochs here, right? And we'll talk about those in just a moment. But his home church, his sending church, if you will, was the city of Antioch in Syria when Paul and Barnabas set out on this journey. Now, this region compromised these cities, and it was made up, and why it was called Galatia, it's interesting to note that this was made up of a region that once was an area that had barbaric Gauls or Celts from where we would call today modern-day England, right, who settled in Asia Minor Minor after several centuries of plundering the Greek and Roman empires. And eventually this region came under the Roman Empire and became a Roman province. Now, what's very important to note is that it is a very high Jewish population. And we'll see why that's important here in just a moment. Now, it's written to the churches here, right? There are some scholars that believe perhaps it was written to the northern section of Galatia, but that would have been a later dating. But most scholars believe, uh, the ones that I read anyway, believe the southern uh, Galatian region was where this letter was written to. Now, it was written from Antioch of Syria. We believe this is not long after the Apostle Paul and Barnabas had returned home to give a report back to Antioch at what had happened on this first missionary journey. So somewhere around 48, 49, maybe even as late as 50 AD, they give this report and he writes it back to the Galatian churches. Now notice, here was the problem. Usually as Paul writes, there's usually a problem he's writing to address. In this case, there were people who were called Judaizers. 
Now, these were Jews who were Christians, or at least claimed to be, and they demanded that Gentiles basically had to become Jewish. And as a result, these Judaizers were causing great confusion and distorting the gospel. They were teaching that the Gentiles had to be circumcised. They had to follow the Mosaic law, customs, and regulations. In other words, a Gentile had to become just like a Jew in order to become a Christian. This has often been called the cross plus circumcision syndrome. Or the cross plus this, the cross plus works, the cross plus anything else. And Paul's writing to address this serious problem that we might call legalism or maybe even traditionalism. In other words, and like today, if, if I, the cross plus baptism, the cross plus taking the Lord's Supper, the cross plus works, the cross plus church membership, right? It's the cross, period. That's what Paul's going to tell them. Now, he wants to remind them that true freedom is found only in the grace given to us by Christ Jesus. Remember, we talked about in this last six weeks together, it is by grace alone that we are saved. Christ gives to us the grace we need to be transformed by the gospel in our everyday lives. The book of Galatians is often called the Magna Carta of Christian or spiritual liberty. Others have called it the Christian's Declaration of Independence. That's kind of an introduction to the book of Galatians. Now, as we dive in, three powerful truths we want to see that Paul gives us in these first ten verses. And what we'll discover is, is that there was, in our title of our message, there was a twisting of the gospel of grace. Now, this is really important because this is how Satan usually functions and operates, is he doesn't blatantly outright say, no, that's not the truth. He just simply takes what is true and just ever so gently twists what is the truth. Paul begins the letter and throughout the letter reminding him of who he was and who had commissioned him to be an apostle and write this letter to the Galatians. He reminds the Galatians of who it is he was trying to please and he also sets the stage for what is to come throughout the rest of the book. By talking about the importance of the gospel of grace... And then he's going to share about how shocked he was, how quickly they had turned from the gospel of grace. They, were, they had become unsteady. They were unsure in their faith, and they were really in a crisis. Maybe some of you this morning, maybe you're in that kind of place. Maybe there's a crisis in your life. Maybe it's a crisis of belief. Maybe it's a, a crisis of understanding the gospel and grace and obedience and how those all two work together. What the Apostle Paul does is he begins the book with grace and he ends the book with grace. He lovingly brings them back to this place of grace and reminds them of the truth. Grace is always greater. Would you stand together in honor of reading God's Word? Let's look at Galatians chapter 1 beginning at verses 1 through 10. Three truths I believe God has for us this morning. It says this, Paul, an apostle... Not sent from men, nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. To him be the glory forevermore. Amen. I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, he is to be accursed. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still striving to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ Jesus. Father, I pray as we dive into these truths this morning that you would teach us by your word Lord, your word is as real and as relevant as it was the day that it was written. Lord, it speaks into the truths of our lives. Lord, I pray we'll be able to apply these truths 
to where we go to work tomorrow and to school and to our neighborhoods and to our places where we find our hobbies or other places where we can have influence. And God, we would live and walk in grace. And God, that really at the end of the day, the real question that we really, the crux of what we're asking this morning is, are we walking in the grace of the gospel? And who is it we're trying to please? Oh God, would you make us to be God pleasers and not man pleasers? Will we seek even this morning to please you and not the person beside us or behind us or in front of us or somebody that's not even here? May our desire as we've come to worship you is to please and honor and glorify your name. God, move in these moments, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Hopefully you got an outline when you came in. Three truths we want to talk about this morning. Number one is this, Paul's confidence, excuse me, Paul's confidence and his compass. Paul's confidence and his compass. In the day and age in which we live, we have to be confident in who we are in Christ Jesus and who he has called us to be. We have to know that we have a compass that, does, that, does, that moves us, that, that points us in a specific direction. And here Paul wants to remind the Galatian church of who he's writing, of who he is, and why he's doing what he's doing. And here Paul really dispenses with the usual greetings. Usually it's longer, it's more involved, but Paul senses there is a great crisis in these churches. And so he dispenses with that and goes straight to almost the message itself. But the first thing he tells us in verse number 1 through 2 is this. We see Paul's credibility and his commission. Paul's credibility and his commission. For when we see, when he's writing the church at Galatia, his credibility is on the line. People are asking questions. These false teachers that have snuck in, that are teaching a gospel that is antithetical, it is opposite to what Paul had preached and proclaimed to them. And so he's telling them, very importantly, you need to know why I'm valid why the message that I've brought is truth. And so Paul is going to defend the fact that he was an apostle of Jesus. And this was significant, right? The apostles' teaching was the bedrock of which the church was founded upon. There were only 12 apostles plus the apostle Paul. And there were some who knew enough about Christendom by, the, Christendom by this point that might call Paul's apostleship into question. We'll see in other letters, you can look through and read in the Corinthian letters and others where Paul's apostleship was questioned. And so Paul is going to tell them and declare to them, this is who I am. And he tells them, I have been commissioned, I have been called and sent by God and not by man. He wasn't some self-appointed preacher or teacher or even an apostle. But instead, he had received this commission from Christ Jesus himself. Listen, friends, I want you to know something. It's important you understand that when you go to your workplace tomorrow, when you go to your home this evening, when you, this afternoon, when you, when you go to your school tomorrow, you have been commissioned by God and sent there as His witness. The Apostle Paul, that's what he was simply saying. I've been sent by God. Man didn't send me. And that's important because if you think man sent you, you will be easily dissuaded. You will be easily discouraged. You will easily want to quit. For if you're only going because the preacher said you ought to, or if a life group leader said you ought to do this or you ought to do that, you'll never last. But if you know that God has told you, that God is hopefully and prayerfully speaking through that pastor, speaking through that leader that is speaking into your life, then you'll know and you'll be able to stand the test of fire that may come your way. You are commissioned and sent by God. Number two, we see Paul's confession. Now, Paul's going to give a greeting here and then give verse 4 a very succinct giving of the gospel. Again, he's in a hurry. He wants to get right into the crux of what was happening in Galatia. And so he gives them a, a greeting in verse 3 and 4. And he says, grace to you and peace to you. Now, that's not unusual. If you read his other letters, you'll see that. But this word grace here in this particular moment is significant. Because it's not just about, hey, it's good to see you and blessings to you. He wants them to know that grace is significant, that grace is important. I love what it says here. One commentator says it this way, that he was reminding him that salvation comes purely by grace and the results in our peace with God. 
You can think of it this way. It is a cause and effect of the gospel in two words. Grace to you and peace. Grace is positional, who we are in Christ. Peace is the practical part that comes from knowing that we are saved by grace. This grace and peace were exactly opposite. As we'll see in a moment, he'll say that we read just a moment ago that they were disturbed. They were not experiencing grace and peace in these moments. And Paul wants to write them and say, this can be yours. And so he reminds them in verse number 4 where he says to them, who gave, talking about Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of God the Father. What has Christ done on our behalf? The word deliver means to rescue. I don't know if you remember or the moment you came to know Christ. Maybe it's fuzzy for some of you. That, listen, I want to tell you, by the way, that's okay. But you have to know the reality that you and I were rescued. We were delivered from the power and from the presence of sin. From sin's condemnation and sin's slavery over our lives, Jesus comes and pours grace out into our lives and into the world. And he wants to clearly remind you and I, right out of the gate to the church at Galatia and to you and me, that it is grace that not only saves us from the penalty of sin, but also from the power of sin. And he reminds you, this has been God's plan all along. This was not some, oh man, I didn't know this was going to happen. God's made this plan from the beginning of time. Paul was sent to Galatia to preach the good news of Christ Jesus and tell them that grace is enough. And grace is greater. It will always meet your spiritual needs. Number three, we see here Paul's commendation. We see Paul's credibility and commission that he shares with them and to us and Paul's confession of the gospel. And thirdly, we see Paul's commendation. Now, many times we can skip a verse like verse 5 and just fly through it, but I don't want us to do that. This is the beauty of why I believe in expository preaching, which means this. We take a book of the Bible and we go verse by verse, sometimes word by word, and see what God has for us. If there's a verse 5 you could think in your life that could be a mission statement over your life, here it would be in verse number 5. To whom be the glory forevermore, and then the word Amen at the end. And the word glory, it's an important word. We find this word from the Old Testament. It means this word means a sense of heaviness, right? Paul was saying this, my calling, commission from God is to share the good news of Christ, but ultimately it is to bring glory to God Almighty. To give glory means to praise or recognize the importance or the weight of something or someone and so we say we give glory to God. It's recognizing who God is, what He has done, and giving God all the glory and taking none of it for ourselves. Why? Because only God deserves the glory. We don't deserve any glory. We really, really don't. That great hymn of faith, O oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise, the glory of my God and King. The question is this, whose glory are you living for? Listen, if you're living for your glory, you'll find out that it can fade very, very quickly. Now, I'm going to ask you, what's this kind of funny? How many of you have... You've already graduated high school, okay? And you have a yearbook or an annual, we used to call it. Like that. Raise your hand. Just, just got, got that yearbook. All right, you got one, all right? Or you got one. How many of you think you could find it when you got home? Well, a few of you, okay, all right, good. All right. How many of you, let's just say you graduated at least 10 years ago, okay? 10 years ago, and you could tell me without looking, maybe 20 years ago is even better, and you could tell me who was the homecoming queen most athletic, Mr. and Mrs., most handsome and beautiful, most witty, most likely to succeed. Now, some of you were in a, maybe a small school, and perhaps it's a little easier for some of you, but for the vast majority of you, I doubt any. I love watching some of your faces. It's really funny from up here. Some of you are going like, you're rolling your eyes like, oh, my gosh, like this is so dumb. Some of you were one of those people, by the way, right? Okay. I was not. No, I was not one of those people. I was just one of them regular old didn't make that book, you know. That's okay. But here's what I want you to see. 
the vast majority of us will never remember any of those things. But yet we're in high school. We're living for the glory of that moment. Nothing wrong with getting those awards. There's nothing wrong with them. It's not like unbiblical or something. But what I want you to see is this. Sometimes we can live for the wrong glory. Listen, when you give God the glory and you live for His glory, then it lasts. It matters. It's significant. And then he ends with this word, amen. Now, some of you wonder why the preacher asks sometimes, why does he want me to say amen? Is that just because I just do that just because it's fun and entertaining? No, no, it's really not. There really is a reason behind the word. The word amen means, you ready for this? So let it be. So when somebody's saying something, I'm agreeing with them, but in agreeing with them, I'm saying, let that truth be true, not only in what he says, but also may it be true where? In me. Sometimes we want to say instead of amen, we need to say instead of, it's it's the oh me or oh my, right? Because it's too close to home. But think about this word amen for just a moment. It means maybe saying yes in my life. When we insert ourselves into the text here by saying amen, it means that we're saying this, I'm moving from being a spectator to a participant. Lord, yes, that is true. I need that to be true in my life. I want that to be true in my life. Alan Cole, in his commentary in the book of Galatians, writes about an old-fashioned Cantonese-speaking Christian. When they say the word, our English word, amen in prayer, It is a Chinese word. It's four different words. I only pretend uh, pretend to pronounce it. But here's what it translates into English. When they say the word amen, watch this. With all my heart, that is what I wish. So Paul was saying in essence, Lord, with all my heart, that is what I want. Is for you to receive the glory and the honor and the praise. Is that true in your life? Is it true in mine? We see Paul's confidence and his compass. Secondly, we see Paul's concern and his charge to the churches in Galatia. Paul's concern and his charge to them. Paul, again, wastes no time. He jumps quickly right into the heart of the message. And I want you to know that Paul is drawing a line in the sand. If if there's ever a season in our culture in American history, if there's ever times to draw lines in the sand, it is today. There are lines that must be drawn. And here in this case, Paul is drawing a line for the sake of the gospel. There are some hills that aren't worth dying on. But folks, let me remind you, we must as believers be willing to die on a hill called Calvary. We must be willing to die for the truth of the gospel, to never water it down, to never compromise, to never kind of say, well, maybe you don't have to do this, or maybe you don't have to do that. No, Paul was saying this is the gospel. We must contend for the faith and not compromise it. In this case, Christ Jesus thought it a hill worth dying on. So should we. And by the way, If I preached that, some of you could have said and put into practice what I've just said. You could have said, oh, God, that's my heart good. 32 of you were listening. Praise the Lord. All right, that's good. That's very good. All right. So here's what I want you to see. Most of us in the room would easily amen that statement. I doubt any of you thought in your mind, well, I tell you what, this preacher is going to preach like that. I'm leaving this building. I doubt any of you would think that. So then where's the question then, preacher? Here's the question. I can sometimes agree with the theology of it, but here's the question. Am I applying it to my life? For if I say I believe something to be true, that the gospel is the gospel, a hill worth dying on, it is a line of sand, here's the question. Does my life reflect that? That's the question we have to ask many of us in the room this morning. So Paul gives his concern in charge. In other words, what he's saying is this. Is my life being transformed by the gospel every single day? Is that grace being poured in my life? 
Paul tells him three things quickly. Verse 6, he tells them, you have quickly deserted the gospel. Paul, when he gets the word, I, here's the idea I get. Paul gets the word and he is in total shock. He cannot believe it. He is like, what? You have got to be kidding me. How is this possible? It's kind of like when Moses was leading the nation of Israel out of, out of uh, Egypt on the way to the promised land. And they've not been gone that long. And, and Moses goes to the mountain to get the Ten Commandments. He comes back down to what's happened. Total chaos has broken out. They're worshiping these golden calves. They've forgotten who God is. They don't know where Moses is. And Moses comes down and, and, and he can't believe it. And God's like, Moses, you got to get down there. He's what he says, how quickly the people have forgotten. Sometimes, if we're not careful, we can hear these words in here this morning, which is always my prayer, you hear these words. But then walk out these four doors or these two doors, and as you hit the parking lot, the words fade, and you don't think about them again. Now, that's, as a pastor, is one of my greatest fears. For if all we do is come in and hear some words, and it's a nice talk, it might as well be a, just a really, really long, long TED Talk, right? Most TED Talks are 10 minutes. I just do four of them a, a Sunday. That's how that works. You see, Paul is saying here, I want you to know and listen what I've heard, but not just hear it, but put it into practice. What he's saying is, how could you have left the gospel? Some enemies had snuck in these Judaizers, and all of a sudden they were following the true gospel, and all of a sudden it seems like months later, if even that long, they weren't following the gospel anymore. Paul was asking, why leave grace? Why leave Jesus for a different gospel? The word here in verse 6 says that they had deserted the gospel. It's a military term. It means to transfer your allegiance to another. It means to turn your back on something or someone. In this case, they had turned their backs on the gospel. Again, as a student minister for 13 years and now as a pastor for 20 years, to look and see into the faces of a high school senior's last May and look at 17 students here on this stage. The question now looks and lingers into September. How many of those 17 are now today walking with Jesus? Or have they like so many and the, the prayers that they would not, but how many they've wandered already from their faith? And we'd say, how quickly? How is that possible? Because... Many times we're not grounded in our faith. And if we're not grounded deeply in our faith, we can so easily then turn. We can, this word, desert our faith. Some later on now call it this word we've mentioned before, deconstructing your faith to go to the extreme. Paul's wondering how could this happen? Secondly, he says the enemy had disturbed them and distorted the gospel. And these churches, listen, what once had been grace and joy and peace had now turned into a churches that were disturbed, they were bothered, they were upset, they were agitated, they were, there was confusion. Why? Because the gospel had been distorted, it had been perverted. This word distorted, pervert means to turn about, to change into an opposite character, to reverse. They had just twisted it ever so slightly and caused it to be perverted. Because here's what the Judaizers would tell you. They believed everything a Christian believes. But the problem is it was I believe that plus just a little something else. It's the cross. We believe all that. We do all that. But you've got to do a few more things in order to get grace. It's kind of like if I had this water bottle and it was full all the way. And I said, well, listen, it's a good bottle of water. It's clean. It's pure. It's, it's you know, it came straight out of probably somebody's tap somewhere, right? It is pure, right? And I just said, you know what? I'm just going to put one, and any of you say, you're thirsty, want to drink? And you say, yes, as a matter of fact, I am kind of thirsty. Right? I'm like, I could drink right now. And I take a drink, and then some of you, I said, well, while you weren't looking, and you come get this drink, I put in just one T90 drop of poison. I'm talking really small in this big bottle. Let me just say I had a bigger bottle. Maybe a gallon. How many of you would drink it? 
I hope none of you, by the way, <laughs> let's just be clear, right? None of you. Why? Because just one drop poisons the whole thing. That's what had happened here in the churches in Galatia. Just one small twist. Let me ask you this. What are our twists today? And it's not so much the theology of what it takes to be saved. Here's what I would say. It's a fire insurance ticket. That's our cross plus something in my mind. I can, I can know all the right things and say the right things and get dunked in a baptistry when I'm 9, 10, 12 years old and then live like however I want to live and then God owes me a place in heaven when I die at 85 because I was a nice person. And one time way back when, I said some words and said a prayer and got wet. But my life was never transformed. Folks, that's not the gospel. The gospel that we proclaim, that is the mission of our church, is to engage people with the hope of the gospel to see them stay the same. Now, that's not it, is it? To see them be good people. To see them be nice people. To see them, you know, come to church every so often and bless the Lord with their presence. No, what does it say? To see their lives, what? Transform. For as we said last Sunday, grace always brings transformation. Paul wanted to know they had thrown grace out the window. And when you throw grace out the window, you throw Jesus out the window. Notice the third thing, the directive about the gospel. Paul gives a direction. He gives clear teaching to correct their confusion. He says in verses 8 and 9, listen, here is the gospel, the one that I came and proclaimed to you. This is it. It'll never change. He, Paul says, no matter what anybody else would teach you, Paul even says, even if an angel comes and teaches you something different than what we taught you, it is not true and that person should be cursed. There will continue to be an ever-growing presence of people who are well-meaning and well-intended and who actually believe they're keeping with the gospel. And they're going to compromise the gospel by saying, well, that's not really what God's words meant. That's not really what God's words said. That's not really what it means. God didn't really mean that you really had to go to church. God didn't really mean you had to follow the Ten Commandments. God didn't really mean you had to obey to follow Him and take His word as it is. That's where we are in our culture. And yet, Paul says, if we teach anything different than what the gospel of Christ proclaims, he says... We should be accursed. So it's a word of warning to those of us who stand in a place like this or who teach. Be careful. I pray that every Sunday I stand in this place and what I'm teaching to you, and I believe that it is, is the truth of the gospel. Because here's what I believe. Listen, I believe with all my heart it can and will transform your life. Thank you. Thank you. Let it be so. It is true. Notice the last. Paul's calling and his commitment. Paul's calling and his commitment. Two truths. All these are powerful wing things to close with this morning. Paul wanted to be very clear right from the outset. I mean, from the very, very get-go, Paul wants to be clear. For those who would accuse him of trying to just appease the Gentiles, which is what they were saying, Paul was kind of trying to bend the rules for them so they didn't have to become Jewish to become a believer. But that's not what Paul was doing at all. Paul wasn't making the gospel easier for them to accept or swallow to some kind of easy believism. So Paul was to remind them two ways of who he is. Number one, he says this at the very end of verse number 10. He says, I am a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Now, we talked about this a little bit last week, but it comes down to this word. Watch this, obedience. And we have to be careful because this word obedience can turn into legalism if we're not careful. And it's all about grace. I get it. 
but grace produces desire. And Paul was saying this, I am a doulos, a bond servant, the lowest of any servant, and Christ is my master and my Lord. Probably almost 20 years ago when I started offering an invitation that I got a chance to offer an invitation every single Sunday since that point. I've offered an invitation with the same ABCs. When I very first offered, I didn't, I didn't add, this only supposed to be one word for each letter, but I added an A at each one, but also added a C letter because it didn't really get the whole point. Because we need to confess Jesus as our Savior. But the other C is we must commit our life to Him as Lord. And too often, the teaching that sneaks into our churches, watch this, is that Jesus being my Savior and Jesus being my Lord are two different things. But listen to me carefully this morning. They're one and the same. You cannot have one without the other. Either Jesus Christ is your Savior and Lord, or He is not. Either you are a bondservant of Jesus Christ, and your life reflects that truth, or He is not. Paul says, I would not be a bondservant of Jesus Christ if I was out to try to please man with my words and my life. But I am who I am in Christ Jesus. I'm a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Too often, I'm afraid, we're willing for Christ to be our master when it fits our schedule. And our schedules, especially since COVID, wow, has changed the church dramatically. The influx of weekend activities Sports and the like make it very difficult. The idea that we tell Christ, well, you know, if it's not too hard, if it fits into my agenda. But see, here's the problem. We start doing that. Here's the problem. All of a sudden, Christ isn't our master anymore. We are. I know this is a challenging word, but Paul brings a challenging word wrapped up in grace. Who is your master? Secondly, he says this, I am a God pleaser, not a man pleaser. Listen, our culture is full of people who are trying to please people. People pleaser Someone who tries to avoid conflict, trouble, ridicule, or pain and will do whatever it takes to avoid not pleasing someone. And so they'll cave to anybody's opinions, thoughts, or ideas. We begin to understand this concept when we hit somewhere around middle school, right? We suddenly become painfully aware of others around us. And that we look around and want people to like us and to be happy with us and to make people happy. And then what does Satan do? He twists it ever so slightly. And that we'll do things to fit in to please people, whether it pleases God or not. Or maybe to please ourselves. And Paul says, I'm not here to please people. My prayer would always be as your pastor that I'm not here to please you or to make you like me or to tickle your ears, as Paul says in 1 Timothy. I'm not out to win a popularity contest or preacher of the year. Here's what I, here's what I have to do. When I step off this stage and I go home this afternoon, I have to answer before God. Did you please me? Were you obedient to my words? Or were you obedient so that they would like you? Or they would pat you on the back and say, good word, preacher. I want to please God. And I pray that that is the same cry of your heart. 
Listen, we know Paul was not a people pleaser. You know how we know that? If you read in Acts 14, when he goes on that first missionary journey, he was threatened multiple times. And finally, one of the last stops, the people from the other cities follow Paul everywhere he goes. They come to the last stop, and they beat him and stone him and leave him for dead. They thought they killed the apostle Paul. And so Paul is saying to the Galatians, really? You think I'm out to please people? If I was out to please people, how did I get stoned and drug outside the city, left for dead? If we'll please God first, listen, you're guaranteed to not please other people. Now, I don't mean that you walk around as a believer and say, I'm pleasing God, forget you, all right? I don't mean that. But if I'm pleasing God... Sometimes I won't please people. And listen, that's okay. We don't do it with arrogance or with pride. We do it with all the humility as a bond servant would do. My goal is not to please my boss. My goal is not to please my board of directors. My goal is not to ple- uh, make my spouse happy. My, my job is not to uh, answer to my parents. Some of you loved that one, didn't you? <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, it's far, it's far greater. It's to please God. That's it. And if we're doing that, then we're walking in grace. And when we walk in grace, then we are transformed by the gospel. I pray this week as you walk, that you'll walk in the truth of the gospel, grace. And that you'll live for His glory and not yours. And your heart's desire will be to please God and not other people. And you'll allow this grace to not be twisted into something that it's not. But it will be exactly what Christ intended and transform your life. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would speak what I pray that you have to every heart in life. God, I thank you for your grace. Lord, it is so good and rich and overflowing. And Lord, I pray in these moments as we have, Father, taken a deep look into these words that Paul wrote thousands of years ago to a church and churches that were struggling. And, Lord, maybe there's some struggling here this morning. Lord, the gospel's been a little twisted. They're not quite grasp the truth and the whole truth of the gospel. Maybe it's been twisted by religion, like in the church in Galatia, the churches there in Galatia. Maybe I've been taught that it's, it's if, I'm, if I'm a church member, if I do or say these certain things, then I'm good. But the reality is if we really run into Jesus and grace, it's not about those things. It's about the gospel and it's about you. So I pray for any person who needs to run into grace this morning. Lord, they would understand those ABCs and pray a prayer. Lord, I admit to you I'm a sinner. And Lord, I ask you today to forgive me of all of my sins. I've missed the mark. And because of my sin, I cannot have a relationship with you. But today I believe that you are the Son of God who came and lived and died for me and rose again and poured out your grace on my life. And today I confess you as my Savior that I cannot save myself and I commit my life to you as Lord. Lord, for some in the room this morning, they need to make that public and say, yes, I need to do that today and, be, and set up my baptism. I pray you give them the courage to come to say yes to you. Not to us, not to me, but to you. And all oh, the joy that comes when we're obedient. For others to come and join this church family and step over the line of being a church that offers grace and teaches and preaches grace. For others this morning, Lord, they walk in the room and the reality is if they're really honest, it's between you and this moment. Lord, they're much more concerned about pleasing others than they are pleasing you. And Lord, would you gently, as you do with your grace, would you gently nudge us and convict us and remind us that we're called to please you. Maybe for some, Lord, they're living for their glory and not for yours. And you would call them back to yourself. And Lord, still, even for others, if they're honest, you are not their master. They are not your servant. But Lord, may they come back home to you and find that you're waiting. 
that it's the best place to be in the arms of grace. God, I thank you that grace is greater and that grace always transforms our lives. May you do that transforming work right here and right now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.